Today, the world just changed. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the Property Imperative Weekly to the 23rd of March 2019. Our latest digest of finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And once again, there's a lot to talk about with the Fed signalling lower interest rates ahead, questions about the RBA strategy, questions also about the APRA data relating to housing mortgages, and of course the old question of what are home prices going to do now. So plenty to discuss today. And just a quick reminder before we start, we do appreciate those who are supporting our efforts either via Patreon, here is the link, or via PayPal where you can make a one-off donation. Again, here is the link. We do appreciate the support that we get from a number of our followers now, and the links are in the comments below. So let's start by looking at the CoreLogic Home Price Index to the 21st of February 2018. In the last week, there have been falls in all the major centres. And the falls are continuing to build over the last month and over the quarter. And in annual terms, Sydney has now gone well over the 10% mark, Melbourne just under 10%, and across the markets it's close to 8%. And perhaps more importantly, the falls from peak are now over 13% in Sydney, over 10% in Melbourne, and Perth is sitting at around 18% now. And the market is just a little below 10%. But remember, of course, that the largest fall from peak is sitting in Darwin at around 25%. So there is really little good news from the Home Price Index perspective. And CoreLogic reported that the auction clearance rates were just a little stronger this week. But of course the volumes remain extremely low. And the weighted average across all the capital cities was 51.4% this week. And it was lower in Melbourne than in Sydney once again. But the volumes continue to remain very low and there is little here to suggest anything other than the same old, same old. There was a very interesting piece from Deutsche Bank this week that looked specifically at the data question and they made a really interesting observation. They say APRA appears to have a data problem. The number of mortgages is up 75% since March 2008, yet the population is only up 18% over the same period. So they suspect the data cannot cope with loan splitting, and hence the average balance data presented is of little use. For example, the average mortgage balance is $276,000 and it's likely to be understated by perhaps 40%. Now this was reported in the Financial Review by Jonathan Shapiro. And this is part of a broader general question about how reliable the statistics are in Australia. We know that the Reserve Bank data is different from the APRA data. And as the AFR article says, the footnote of ANZ Banking Group's full year results makes the point that the figures include increases to existing accounts and split loans, fixed and variable components of the same loan. And the APRA data is also significantly different to figures presented by the AXX listed aggregator AFG, who reports its average home loan balance to be $509,000. And my own analysis from my surveys suggests that the average mortgage, not the average loan, is about $486,000 across Australia. So we agree with the analysis. So I think it's important to understand that the data that we are basing a whole bunch of decisions off may not be very accurate. And it could well be that there's a tendency to pick the lower number, the split loan number, because it doesn't sound so bad, 
and you could then take that loan and make an assessment relative to income and get a consistently lower loan to income figure than is real. And of course the DFA survey continues to show very high loans, very high loan to income ratios and very significant risks in the system. Now the RBA published its quarterly bulletin on the 21st of March and there was quite a lot of interesting information contained within it. One of the most interesting comments relates to the update of Australia's financial aggregates. And they're going to make some changes ahead. And interestingly, they suggested that these changes will do two things. Firstly, they will get more accurate information from the non-bank sector rather than rely on estimates because more of the non-banks are now going to be providing data into the series. But secondly, the changes that they're making may well increase relatively the proportion of mortgages classed as investment mortgages and reduce those relating to owner occupation. So we'll see some changes in April and beyond and they're going to run parallel series then. More noise in the system I'm afraid and whilst the data may be better later the fact that the data will change from what we're used to is I think a significant issue. Also in the bulletin this time there was an interesting article on wealth and consumption and they basically made the point that housing wealth has definitely had an impact on households ability to spend and wish to spend. But they also argue that even though housing and wealth may decline now as home prices fall, if income continues quite strongly, their modelling suggests that household consumption will still be quite buoyant. However, I have to say that I'm less convinced by this. Looking at my surveys, it seems to me that as household wealth is being eroded because home prices are falling, households are hunkering down. The household consumption and income chart illustrates the issue that real disposable income is falling and this is now having a downward impact on consumption. And they also try to make some estimations of the relative elasticity of consumption by different categories. And the chart shows that, for example, vehicle sales are quite sensitive to what may happen to incomes. We're seeing this in terms of slower sales for autos at the moment, as well, by the way, as higher levels of default in the auto industry. So this analysis underscores once again to me that the fall in home prices that we're seeing across the country at the moment will continue to have a significant impact on household budgets and their spending expectations. And whilst the Reserve Bank does say that should incomes rise, that can offset some of those falls, all of the data that I'm seeing suggests that incomes are going to remain pretty static for quite a long period of time. So I think there's more news on the downside here. Now there was another article in the bulletin which was also worth reading and that related to the developments in banks funding costs and lending rates. Now we've seen for some time that funding has been under pressure with regard to the banks and they've responded firstly by lifting mortgage rates out of cycle and secondly by dropping rates on deposits. So this information gives us a little bit of a sense of where the banks currently stand and they conclude that margins are still under pressure. Their first observation is that the bank's funding composition was little changed over 2018. Domestic deposits was above 60%. Then you've got the short term and the long term debt. Of course short term debt is in some ways more exposed to short-term market changes. They also give us a view of the major bank's wholesale debt. And you can see there that there is a proportion that is offshore. And some of that is also short-term. One of the most stunning charts is that the variable housing interest rate has risen quite significantly and is well above 5.5%. But the rate for ongoing loans, of course, is lower. And this is going back to this question of the standard variable reference rates has very little connection with real interest rates. And we've seen a bit of an uptick 
in terms of rates on outstanding loans. But the price of new loans is considerably lower. And this is all to do with significant competition relating to the origination of new loans in the marketplace. They also show that variable business lending rates have risen, especially for large businesses. Now they are more connected with the BBSW, so that's perhaps not too surprising. And their final conclusion is that net-net bank funding costs and lending rates have moved such that their net margin has been compressed just a little. So this tells me that it is likely that we will continue to see pressure on existing mortgage rate portfolios as banks continue to cut rates to try and attract new business and as international funding costs continue to put pressure on the local banks. Now we're on the lookout these days for early indicators of more downside risks ahead. And one of the most significant ones is potentially in the construction sector. We see it in our SME surveys already that many traders are now struggling with work. And the ABC published a post this week which underscored the fact that the construction sector is in difficulty. And there was a nice chart which was floating around Twitter which showed that the construction job ads and those employed in construction were both falling. And it could be that over the next few months we're going to see around 200,000 jobs in construction disappear. There are more than 1 million in construction at the moment. Now if that does eventuate, that's clearly going to be another downward force on the overall economic performance of Australia. And of course John Adams is going to take the debate forward on Monday when he goes on to Sky and has a debate with Christopher Joy. And there was a short video on the interests of the People channel, the epic showdown, which was John's thoughts prior to going on the show. Now we covered off in a separate post the Fed discussion this week and their announcement that rates are looking as though they'll go lower rather than higher because of weaker growth weaker inflation and, frankly, an about turn in terms of policy from the Fed. But it's worth just looking in more detail at the policy rate settings. And this chart just builds from March 2018, where the projection was that rates will be close to 3.4% by 2020. In June 18, they said that the rates perhaps would accelerate earlier than that. In September, they suggested that rates would stay higher for longer. In December, those rate expectations came back somewhat, but were still about 3% in 2020 and 2021 before falling in the longer term. And now the March rate expectations are considerably lower. And this reflects a change of strategy and direction from the Fed, which I think will have significant and profound impact on both the markets and on future monetary policy in the US and more broadly. And so to the markets, the S&P ASX 100 ended up on Friday 0.53% to 5,104 and is up 4.75% from this time last year. The S&P ASX Volatility Index was down 2.43% to end at 11.30 and is down 6.97% from a year ago. The S&P ASX Financials Index it was up 0.54% on Friday to end at 5,868 and is down 7.23% over the last 12 months. ANZ was up 0.26% to end at 2652 and is down 6.18% from 12 months ago. CBA was up 0.42% on Friday to 7143 and is down 5.41% over the last year. NAB 
was up 0.52% on Friday to 25.09 and is down 15% from the last 12 months. Westpac was up 0.68% to 26.51 and is down 11.02% from the last year. The Bank of Queensland was up 0.44% to end at 9.18 and is down 21.84% over the last year. Suncorp was up 1.90% to end at 13.44 and is down 2.05% over the last 12 months. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank was down 0.10% to end at 9.62 and is down 8.29% over the last 12 months. AMP was up 0.46% to end at 2.20 and is down 57.85% over the last year. Macquarie was up 0.11% to end at 126.97 and is up 21.02% for the last year. Gemworth Mortgage Insurance was up 0.82% to 2.46 and is up 4.24% over the last year. Mortgage Choice was down 1.29% on Friday to end at 96 cents and is down more than 49% from 12 months ago. Yellow Brick Road ended at 7 cents and is down 50% over the last year. And McGrath was at 26 cents and is down 35% over the last 12 months. The Aussie dollar ended up 0.06% to 70.87 on Friday and is down 8.54% over the last 12 months. The gold Aussie cross was up 0.75% on Friday to end at 1,855 and is up 7.47% over the last year. And Bitcoin Aussie Cross was down 3.20% on Friday to end at 4,678 and is down 61.5% over the last 12 months. Now across to the US. The Dow was down 1.77% on Friday to 25,502 but is still up 5.19% over the last year. The S&P 100 was down 1.89% to end at 1,239 and is up 6.17% over the last 12 months. The S&P 500 was down 1.90% to end at 2,800 and is up 5.27% over the last 12 months. The volatility index was up 20.91% to end at 1648 but is still down 23.68% from 12 months ago. The S&P 500 Financials Index was up 0.64% to end at 442.54 and is down 7.23% over the last 12 months. Goldman Sachs was down 2.89% to end at 188.96 and is down 25.69% over the last year. The Nasdaq was down 0.25% on Friday to 7,642 and is up 6.72% over the last 12 months. Apple was down 2.07% on Friday to 191.05 and is up 13.91% over the last year. Google Alphabet was down 2.30% to 1,207 and is up 12.99% over the last 12 months. Amazon was down 3% to 1,764 and is up 15% over the last year. Facebook was down 1.05% to 164.34 and is down 1.95% over last year. Intel was down 2.53% to 53.26 and is up 5.97% over the last 12 months. The United States 10-year bond was down 0.72% to 243. Whilst the three-month bond was down 0.38% to 2.45. The US dollar index was up 0.05% on Friday to 96.55 and is up 7.33% over the last 12 months. The British pound US dollar was up 0.06% to 
1.3216 and is down 7.13% over the last 12 months. The FTSE was down 2% to 7,207 and is still up 4.49% but was adversely impacted by the Brexit news and the continuing uncertainty that we see there. The FTSE Financial Services Index was down 2.03% to 654 and is up 0.32% over the last 12 months. The Royal Bank of Scotland was down 0.28% to enter 248.20 and is down 4.96% over the last 12 months. The Euro was at 113.15 which is up 0.01% on Friday down 7.85% over the last 12 months. Deutsche Bank was down 1.99% to end at 7.32 and is down 39.01%. And the discussion with regard to the Commerce Bank merger continues. The Chinese yen US dollar was down 0.28% on Friday to end at 0.1489 and is down 5.69. Crude oil was down 1.68% to end at 58.97 and is down 8.01% over the last year. The gold futures was up 0.46% to end at 1,313 and is down 3.64% over the last year. Silver was flat at 15.43 and is down 5.35% over the last year. Copper was down 2% to end at 2.84 and is down 4.53% over the last 12 months. And Bitcoin was down 0.07% to end at 4,046 and is still down 54 0.52% over the last 12 months. So to conclude, more data showing we have significant questions here in Australia, concerns about the future trajectory of the Fed, and perhaps more early warning signs of problems ahead. And indeed, as John Adams tweeted today, the US yield curve has now inverted. And that is often a signal of a recession ahead. Now, just before I go, a quick reminder that Harry Dent and I will be running a webinar on Monday at 12 p.m. Sydney time. And you're welcome to pre-register to join us in that session. Harry and I will be discussing some of the latest data and his ideas coming from his most recent book, as well as some broader trends about the prospects of a market correction down the track. Now, you may or may not agree with Harry, but he's always good value, and I think it will be an interesting session. The links to register are in the comments below. If you found this post useful or interesting, please like it, share it, and add a comment or question. I read them all. And if you haven't yet subscribed to receive alerts, please do so by ringing that subscribe bell. And if you have already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.